Folks, we do this for the preservation of history. I hope to light a spark, as well as all these guys do, in somebody's heart to go read a book about U.S. history, to read a book about Wild Bill Hickok. The captain's going to give you information. He talks a lot. Trust me, this man can talk. And I can too, because he's my dad. We are going to tell you factual history the best we know. The things may not look too factual today, but these are things that changed and formed the legend of Wild Bill Hickok. Folks, the captain will tell you that we're going to find ourselves on the I&M Canal. You may not realize it, but the I&M Canal is right back here. And Bill's recorded as, actually, Bill went to school here, maybe. The captain will tell you he probably didn't spend much time there, but this is the schoolhouse the Hickok children attended. We're going to find ourselves on the I&M Canal, and Bill is working on the I&M Canal as a young man. He's going to get in a fight on the I&M Canal, and it's going to change his life forever. He's going to become the James Butler Wild Bill Hickok that you read about and will see about today. Ladies and gentlemen, here is your free entertainment. Trust me, you're going to see why. Here's your free entertainment, the Old West Regulators and the Life and Times of Wild Bill Hickok. Is the captain will be telling you, he'll be jumping from time to time in Bill's life. We're going to start out here at the i &M Canal, like I told you, and we're going to go all the way to Deadwood. And remember the name Deadwood, because Deadwood means a lot. But each time, I'm going to come out and try to help you make the jump, because we're going to cover 33 years in about an hour and a half, or less. I think it's 33 years. <laughs> Does anybody remember? Hickok probably doesn't, because he died and he can't talk to me anymore. But, so that's kind of what's happening, and I'm totally ad living. I told you my dad talks, I talk, we all talk. Welcome. The sound lady's still in, whoop, and man is there to fix it. Look out. But, so maybe if I explain a stagecoach stop, a stagecoach stop, and I'm going to do it again later so I can just do it twice. That way you can't say, when you take the test, you'll have to have the answer because I told you twice. A stagecoach stop is where you stopped, they changed horses, they watered horses, you got out and got to stretch your legs, sometimes there was food there, um, and we're going to have a stagecoach stop in here. We don't have a stagecoach, unfortunately. Um, there are going to be a lot of saloon scenes. Okay, we're going to go now to the captain who's going to tell you about the beginning of Wild Bill's life in Troy Grove, Illinois. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, cowboys and Indians, welcome to the life and times of James Butler Hickok. Some of you folks may be more familiar with the popular term Wild Bill Hickok. But just for today, the Old West Regulators would like you to travel with us as we take you on the historical journey of Wild Bill's life. From his humble beginnings as a boy growing up in Homer, Illinois, to his last days in Dakota Territory. Now friends, Alonzo and Polly married in 1827 and by 1833 moved to Illinois, finally settling in Homer which would later be incorporated under the name of Troy Grove by April 1886. The year is 1836. The Black Hawk War ended just five years previous. Martin Van Buren is the eighth president of our country. And in Homer, Illinois, William Alonzo and Polly Butler Hickok are expecting their fourth child. His name would be James Butler, and he would be a legend by the time he is 30. His father was the first business owner in Homer opening a general store. It was called the Green Mountain House. What did they sell, you asked? Stuff. Buffalo, beef steak, rattlesnake, and chocolate cake, ham, ram, lamb, and spam, peanuts, popcorn, cracker jacks with a prize in every box. However, Due to the financial crash of 1837, 
the family business did not survive, and that's when the Hickox turned to farming. These interests just weren't James Butler's cup of tea, so to speak, but he was quite fond of outdoor life, hunting, exploring, and had a fondness for shooting sports, especially handguns. Did he have a premonition that these skills would be so valuable in later life? It's certainly a good question. You know, the Hickox had a secret that was later revealed. They were involved in the abolitionist movement, helping former slaves escape to freedom by way of the Underground Railroad. Perhaps this is where he developed, during those tense moments, the compassion for the oppressed while helping them to freedom from the bounty hunters. By 1851, Oliver, his brother, caught gold fever and left for California, leaving the family behind. Alonzo and William went back east for a family visit. James, his mother, and sister Celinda and Lydia remained at home. Could this have been Providence? It was James Skill with a rifle and a pistol that put meat on the table for the family during that time. By May 1852, William Hickok had died, and by 1855, 18-year-old James Butler is a mule skinner on the Illinois-Michigan Canal. That sandstone building you see was built in 1848, and today it serves as the original LaSalle County Historical Museum, preserving local and national history. This ditch you see here to the south was part of that canal. Boats on this canal carried most everything that was freight across the state, including passengers. It was smoother than riding in a stagecoach and you could travel about a hundred miles at about three mile an hour, thereby giving folks time to think about their plans when they got to the other end. You could find yourself keeping company with gamblers, ruffians, roustabouts, and even a few farm animals along the way. Now you folks can experience this same boat trip today, just down the river from here in the LaSalle. Come back with me in time, if you will, to the year 1855. James Butler Hickok is employed as a mule skinner on this i &M canal. When he found a fellow by the name of Charlie Hudson mistreating one of the mules, he stepped in in behalf of the mule. Now Charlie and Bill weren't the best of friends, and Charlie forgot to duck and caught a blow from Bill that landed him at the bottom of the canal. At the time, Bill thought he had sent Charlie to meet his maker and ran straight for home, where his mother sent him far away from LaSalle County to become that legend of the Wild West that he still is today. I lost him again. There he is. God, he is sneaky. Okay. So you just saw Bill, like I told you, get in a fight with Charlie Hudson. He thought he killed Charlie Hudson. So he goes home and tells his mom what he's done. And she says, get the heck out of town. Right? And she sends him away. When we catch up with Bill again, it's going to be 1861 in Rock Creek Station, Nebraska. Have any of y'all ever been to Nebraska? Oh, goodness sakes. It's not, uh, well, that's not very nice because somebody could be from Nebraska. At 18 years. <laughs> so we're in Nebraska at the stage stop, Rock Creek Station. It's not a town, it's a stage stop. We're also in the midst of one of the most devastating times in U.S. history. We are in the middle of the Civil War. We are getting a good start in a very uncivil war. Bill has become acquainted with a young man named, what would become, Buffalo Bill Cody. He's going to be a big deal in Bill's life. Bill is at Rock Creek Station getting over a fight with a mama bear. There's a lot of things Bill fought, but the mama bear was probably not one of me ever tried again. At this stage stop, this is where it gets good, folks. I don't repeat gossip. 
So listen close the first time I tell you, okay? Because I don't want to get in trouble for repeating anything. All right. We're at Rock Creek Station. At Rock Creek Station, there's this lady named Sarah. There's also this guy named Mike Wellman and his wife and Wild Bill. But Sarah, Sarah is the girlfriend to a man named Big Dave McCannells. Now, Big Dave McCannells, he's oh, not a nice man. He's got a wife back east and a girlfriend in Nebraska. Yeah, that's what we're dealing with, folks. Yeah, you. you. So I told you, folks, I'm not a gossip. But you better be paying close attention to what the captain tells you about Big Dave and Sarah and Hickok. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to the captain as we go to Rock Creek Station. At 18 years old, Bill found out just how big this old world could be. This ain't your fight. Well, it might end up being my fight. He told you he'd pay you, just not today. I'm tired of excuses, boys. He's a man of his Excuses word. don't feed the horses, they don't pay nothing. I say go get it right now, or there's going to be hell to pay. You're just a pusher, aren't you? All you like to be is a pusher. I can make it work. You gonna talk me to death, you're gonna get busy. He told you he'll pay you. Not today, but he will pay you. So you ain't taking my girlfriend and my outfit all at one time, buddy. Oh, boys. Jet pay you. Just give me a little time. Well, let me hang on to the watch. I get your money, you get your watch back. Well, I don't want you showing this watch around. It was my daddy's. Like, yes, you have to do that, but don't you be showing it around. Yeah, my word. Remember, be showing that watch around. Dead man don't walk. All right, I'll remember that. Uh, hit it. Give me two. Throw me a little more of that foot bath. Oh, I'm sorry. Hope for some aces. Give me some aces, too. Thank you, ma'am. You're You're cheating me on one. I need one other card. You can give me another one. You had that one flipped up. Thank you, sir. Better not be. 
Showing my watch off. What'd I tell you? Talk, we're we're friends, and you're doing this. So you know what that makes us now? Enemies. Well, that's where we're at. I want my watch back. It was my daddy's. Just hand it over. Get your hand off that gun or you're gonna end up dead. I'd hate to see that, but it's gonna happen. You know I don't miss. Ah, he shot up dead from 70 pieces! Nice. Lost the last election. He stays in Hayes City. He's gambling and he's keeping a fellow company by the name of William F. Cody. He's better known today as Buffalo Bill for providing meat for the railroad and the army. And some folks say he shot a lot more buffalo in back of Tommy Drum Saloon than he did out west of town. Well, all righty then. If you're in James Butler Hickok's line of work, you cannot afford a misfire on a revolver. Every day, he would find a place to unload the chambers from the day before and reload those revolvers. You could not afford a misfire on a cap and ball, and it would happen with some frequency if you weren't pretty proficient. There were a lot of newspaper men that recorded in the day that he would put on a bit of an exhibition in the mornings when folks knew he was going to empty those guns and reload them again. They would catch him out on the street, maybe offer up a tomato can, or some sort of a target, whereby he would keep the can rolling down the street till both guns were empty. Or oftentimes they would throw one in the air and he would shoot up in the air and keep it from hitting the ground till they were empty. Several newspapers record this as fact. His peripheral vision was so good that he could stand in the middle of the street with a post on either side, shoot simultaneously and hit both posts. Recorded history, folks. It's on the evening of July 17th, 1870, and Wild Bill is in Patty Welsh Saloon. That some of the boys from the 7th Cavalry were in town, and they were no friends of Hickok, including a fellow by the name of Tom Custer, the brother of George A. Custer, the famous general. There are two troopers in town, one by the name of Londergan and one by the name of Kyle, and they lead the attack. Step back in time with me as we take a look on the streets of Hayes in the saloon where Hickok was blindsided. He was dead. <laughs> the thing about that shot, the thing about that attack, was that Bill was blindsided. The only reason Bill lived to finish that attack off and finish those guys off was that gun misfired. That's why Bill practiced every day to keep his gun from misfiring. And he killed both of them on a misfire. And he won. It's just a sleepy little town on a stagecoach stop. Later, it would be a whistle stop on the Kansas Pacific Railroad. It was discovered by a fellow named Joseph G. McCoy, a cattle buyer from a little town called Springfield, Illinois. He drew up the plans and he built the pens to hold these longhorn cattle that would be coming up from Texas. Joseph McCoy just happened to be mayor of Abilene, and as soon as he found out Wild Bill was in town, it wasn't long, April 15th to be exact, Wild Bill became marshal of Abilene. The news caused a stir. 
especially with the Texas Cowboys bringing the herds north. You look like you ain't been getting enough sleep. What's yeah, you know, I'm getting old, but not that old. So what do you need? I need you boys to check your guns and uh, stop making noise. There's no shooting, no guns in town. You check them when you come in. Hickok, see these boys back here? I see them. They've been about three months, no water, no feed, clothes wore out. They finally got up here with a herd of little mossy horns, and you're telling them they can't have fun. They can have fun, but just not with them guns. They're not going to be shooting them in town. Well, I think we got more guys than you, buddy. <laughs> and I don't you know think... I don't miss. I ain't looking for a fight, but if you want one, you're going to get it. Leave us alone. <laughs> We've been riding all time. <laughs> There wasn't no call for that, Hickok. He Boys, you nothing. got two choices. You know, I've dealt with you rebels during the war. I ain't going to deal with you today. You can either turn around and leave town, or we can settle this right here and now. What's it going to be? I don't think you got the sand for it, Hickok. Oh. Street and gone. Wages, a typical move then that day. Bill heads for Colorado where he meets Charlie Utter. Later, Wild Bill tries his hand at show business again with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show and traveled out east. Between the bright lights and the pranks, coupled with live ammunition. His career as an entertainer was cut short. You folks remember when I told you about the lady who owned the circus and had the pretty red dress? Her name was Agnes Lake. Well, they met once more and they stayed in touch. Well, they decided to get married in the spring of 1876. <laughs> that just goes to show you folks that a gal with lipstick can go farther than a man with a Winchester and a side of bacon. He and Agnes living in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and in a couple of months, Bill gets restless, teams up with his buddies, California Joe, Charlie Utter, and a few other scouts, and they're heading out in a wagon train bound for Dakota Territory. Along that trail, Wild Bill discovers a young lady by the name of Martha Jane Canary, better known in history as Calamity Jane. Calamity Jane was quite a lady. She had worked in the freight hauling business and she did whatever she had to do to make a living, including Men's Wars II, 1876. Wild Bill walks over to Nuttle and Mann's number 10 saloon. Did he have a premonition? He indeed had a keen spiritual side, as he had mentioned it, warning him in times of danger. To his good friend, Charlie Utter, Charlie, I feel this is going to be my last camp and I won't leave it alive. What's up, boys? I'm on three. I'm gonna do some gambling and chase some women. Maybe even catch a few. Yeah, yeah. You guys are playing pretty hard here. Yeah, a lot of gaming going on. Anybody winning any money? Hi, right, Bill. You got a drink here, ladies? Anybody got any money to lose? If you hurry, you can have a little bit of mine. Some left. How about you, buddy? You lose all your money yet? At a bar in town? These boys not clean me out. Need some steaks or something? Yeah. <laughs> Look at there. Ready? Not yet. Yeah, good day. 
Bad luck. <laughs> Well, it looks like you've got the rest of my money. I win me some money so I can bring a couple of them girls home with me. Go for some aces. Go for some aces. <laughs> any dirt for your financing the next trip in here. I don't know what I'm doing anymore these days. I hear there's a couple strikes here pretty close to town. Oh, she's hot and windy out there today, you boys. Hot real good. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for sharing with us today. I want to tell you on behalf of the LaSalle County Historical Society and the Old West Regulators, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, LaSalle County Historical Society and the Old West Here. 